Good evening. I'd like to share with you an understanding, a puzzle, and a heresy. What three? Understanding, a puzzle, and a heresy. Ooh. Right. Good. Okay. Here we go now. What are we going to do? To introduce you into this, this is going to be somewhat unorthodox. Therefore, that's the heresy. And all set. I have a copy of the Phaedo, and I'm going to read a few sections out of it once in a while. But the myth of the Phaedo is the concluding part of the great dialogue between Socrates, Simeus, and Cebes. After it's over, he prepares for his death, has a few words with Cebes, drinks the hemlock, and dies. All right. Now, there are several controlling myths in the Phaedo. We are only tonight going to talk about the, what is called the formal myth. There are other myths. There's the Theseus myth. There's the myth of Harmonia. There's the myth of Cadmus. There's the myth of Apollo. All of these play a role. But right now we're just going to focus on this extended myth at the end of the dialogue. Here is the first puzzle. Hey, Here it is. The whole dialogue is about death. The whole dialogue is about death. Socrates says something quite amazing. He says, true philosophy is nothing other than the study of dying and being dead. And he makes it quite clear that he's using these words in an unusual way because he says, most people do not know in what way Philosophers desire death. They don't know in what way philosophers deserve death. And most essentially, the many do not understand what kind of death it is. Therefore, we don't want to be among the many. We want to know in what way they desire death deserve it, and the kind of it. Well, first, the idea is quite important to get of the idea of soul. Soul takes on various meanings. You can talk about the parts of the soul being reason, uh, talk about it being the spirited element, you can talk about it being the appetitive element, brought together into a unity, and we can call that soul. It's also, right from the root, psyche, breath, vitality, breath, vitality, the vitality in breath, very much what the Hindus mean by prana. Therefore, that breath or vitality is extended through the whole body. Therefore, I'm going to picture that in this way. That's the vitality. In other words, right now we should be able to demonstrate that you can focus that interesting thing we have in various places uh, try not to be aware of your right foot. Right? Try not to be aware of what's going on in your right foot. Or don't pay any attention what your left hand is doing. Well, we go right for it, don't we? See, we're, there's something within us that is distributed throughout that we get in touch with. Now, how do you die? How do you die? Because 
there is a way of dying if there's a certain kind of death. There's a way of dying, and that's what philosophers, real philosophers, study. See, ING, process, completion, being dead. Two parts, a process. He says, death is a purification. See, it's a purification. There's something you have to do. It's a process, and if you're successful, that's going to be death. Well, what is it? Well, let me give you a quote. So, it's so important that I have to share the quote with you. It's one of my favorite quotes. Um, there are times when you don't want to be told, and this is one of them. You don't want to be told. Two quote's too important. Now, the big thing we want to know, we want to know two things. I want to know this, this curious thing called death is the separation, is the separation of the soul from the body. Well, there are a lot of ways in which you can say you're separating the soul from the body. Uh, there are a lot of things you can avoid, such as too much at attachment to things of the body. Everybody knows that. I want to talk about something else. Death is the separation of the soul from the body. Death is the separation of the soul from the body. And the state of being dead is the state in which the body is separated from the soul and exists alone by itself, and the soul is separated from the body and exists by itself. Therefore, there has to be a complete separation so that the soul is alone by itself. Now, I want to jump and give you a very interesting quote. Does not the purification, does not the purification consist in this, which we've mentioned many times in our discussions, discourses, in separating as far as possible the soul from the body and teaching the soul the habit, see it's a habit, a habit of collecting and bringing itself together from all parts of the body the habit is something you have to keep trying, keep doing. It's the habit of, see, it's the habit of bringing itself together from all parts of the body and living as far as it can, both now and hereafter. Right. We all have to obviously face the, the death of the hereafter, right? That's when you drop dead and you're buried, right? Or something, right? But this is a practice that you have to learn and do now. That's a yogi. That's a yogi practice. That's a separates the soul from the body. That's true philosophy. That is philosophy. And he makes it quite clear. Right? As freed from the body as from fetters. That's the goal. Now, what do you get, what do you get if you get that? I mean, what, what is so important about this process? Why do it? Why separate the soul from the body to Plato? He says, I'll tell you why. You get something. You see something. And thank goodness we have another sheet. He says, when the soul separates them from the body and is alone by itself, 
Watch the language now. Language is going to be important. It departs into the realm of the pure, the everlasting, the immortal, and the changeless. Hmm. Everlasting, the immortal, and the changeless. And what does then the soul do? The soul then is in communion with that. And remains always, it hey, remains always the same, unchanging with the changeless, since it's in communion therewith. And you know what that's called? That's called wisdom. That's what it's called. Now, when that state is experienced, it is said to be the most beautiful state. Nothing more beautiful than that experience of it. What you encounter is something that is eternal, everlasting, unchanging, and one recognizes in it that that is nothing other than pure. Now this is where we're making a, a, a jump, and I'll go back to it in a few minutes. All right? It's a jump because what you recognize is that this is pure being. Capital B. That's the nature of ultimate reality. What's so interesting about that? is that one recognizes the nature of ultimate reality, is that which you are in communion with, and therefore that's you participating in the divine. You recognize it because you recognize it's no different than mind itself, sometimes called intellect. It's the source of, and it is a vitality beyond description. All those words together in Greek philosophy means wisdom. That's what you get with the separation of the soul from the body. Now, you might want to know where this last quote is. Um, and I believe it's at 81. Let me just make sure. I think it's 81 for those of you who would like to quote. Oh, thank you. Would you read it for me? But when she examines herself, she goes away yonder to the pure and everlasting and immortal and unchanging. And being akin to that, she abides ever with it, whenever it becomes possible for her to abide by herself. I don't know if this is it. Is this it? Yes, I like and it. And there like she rests from her wandering. And while she is amongst those things, she is herself unchanging because what she takes hold of is unchanging. And this state of the soul has the name of wisdom. Wisdom? Good. Thank you. Good. I'd like to just add to that at 81. Right. It gathers itself into itself alone. And since this has always been its constant study, this means nothing else than it pursued philosophy rightly and really practiced being in a state of death. Now, is not this the practice of death? Yes. Right. And this is apprehended by the mind, right? Intellect, mind, right? 83. 81, 79 are the references to that. 
All right, now look here. Excuse me, when you say the word yes. mine, yes. what yes. word, what mine? word are you using? For mine? Yes. Um, it's not psyche. No, 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 no. It's like no. soul. No, no. Uh, for, for mind, I, the word I just used, no uh, uh, noetan, which is uh, intellect. All right, good. Now, look here. Now this dialogue goes on. Both Simeus and Cebes do not understand what's going on. They're worried because they have the other idea of death. The idea that, well, when you die, it's all over, and the soul just kind of whisks away like smoke in the wind, and there's nothing there left. And so Socrates then has to then take them through a dialogue to show them the foolishness of their views. Therefore, when the dialogue concluded, Socrates then brings them back into this issue of death again. And he says, you know, I want to describe what I think this experience is. What it is the soul of man is going to encounter. Now, you see, here is where the puzzle comes in. Death, right, that can be at the end of life, and therefore that's when death is the separation of the soul from the body, right? and it then goes to the other world, that's the assumption here, right? and then that it awaits judgment. This idea of death that we just explored is experiencing death because you're experiencing the separation while you're still alive. So therefore, in, its, in that real sense, you experience death before you drop dead. Now, look here. He's now going to talk about what it's like in this realm of the dead. Hey, which one? Which one? Both? Simultaneously? Is it possible, therefore, that this myth that we're going to look at is simultaneously not only the physical death, physical death of the body, right, the separation of the soul, and then this is, therefore, a map. Sometimes they're called maps of consciousness. This is presumably a map of what it's like, what one will encounter, rushing then into this state of mind called death. Now, it operates on two levels. Now, what does that mean? Um, heresy. We need the heresy now, don't we? Here it comes. People can experience this state when they're not prepared for it. All of these people that go on these psychedelic trips and have these terrible experiences are people who have stepped into the world of the spirit without any preparation, without any discipline, without any forethought. And what they experience you can take and we can say, it's here, 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 here. So therefore, I'm going to read this, therefore, and you're going to highlight. Unfortunately, we won't have enough time to read the whole thing or we'll talk about the whole thing, but I do want to pick up some major things so that we can explore this idea. The idea that Plato gives us a map of what the separation of the body and the soul is and what one will encounter. He's going to do it on several levels. Each level we could actually put a different map, different stage. 
because for different people with different backgrounds, they experience different things. Therefore, it's a multi-leveled map. Some structural features run through the whole thing. And therefore, in giving a description of what this is like, what one encounters, there are certain features that go for all, for everyone. And I want to know whether or not, as you look at this description we just gave here of wisdom, whether or not certain terms reappear when he talks about the journey into the next world at the moment of death, whether it's the physical or the spiritual or the philosophical, at this point doesn't make any difference to us. First thing he says, which is very important, which is the same thing he said last in our last talk on the myth of Ur, is that for all souls who are going to experience death, there is a terrible danger right from the beginning of the experience of death. It's a terrible danger not to be prepared for death. He says, hey, wait a minute. You should study it. It should be your object of concern. If the soul is in fact immortal, then you better do it because you know what? You want to be in the best preparation for an inevitable journey. This terrible danger, what's interesting about this whole thing we mentioned last time, and I'd like to go back to it, there is no learning that takes place in the next world. There's no learning, no growth. What you're carrying are the implications of all that you've known, you've come to know, all your learning, what they call paideia, all everything that brought about your growth, that's what you take with you. All that you've learned, that's what you take with you. Therefore, you take with you the full corpus, right? The full, uh, what should we call it? The full gestalt of the, the totality of your nurture and your education in the highest sense. That's what you take with you. Therefore, if you take, with it, take it with you, then you're going to look at everything and experience everything through that learning. Because that's a terrible danger, because therefore, hey, you're going to misunderstand some of it, and that's going to cost you. But it doesn't have a positive side. You're not going to learn something there, because there's only one place you can learn. And that's not there. So therefore, what does he say? He says, well, the first thing he says, look at two possibilities. If, if you know about it, if you're prepared for it, if you have a positive attitude towards it, then, then you'll follow your guide. The very guide that's been with you your whole life, you'll recognize. So, ah, buddy, buddy, I didn't know that was you standing behind me and helping me. And then you... Learn. If you're prepared for it and you understand these things, that means you understand the circumstances of what you are going to experience. The other side, no philosophy, no thoughts. And if there's a very strong attachment to the physical universe, and the physical body on death, then there's a wandering around and a wandering around, pointless meandering. One or the other. He says, now for those people who have studied and pursued the life of the spirit, or philosophy, same thing, they have encountered something quite interesting. They, in fact, when they follow the guide, pick up another guide. Gods for companions and gods for guides. So there's a whole range of possible guides. So now I'd like to talk about the earth. Now, the basic metaphysics, if you want, in all of Plato, which is clearly seized upon by all the Neoplatonists, is very simple. And all it involves is one idea, thank goodness. That's this one. Whenever there are two things, two domains, there is always an interconnection or place where there's a communion between the two. That is essential.
because of this you can say A is like B and B is like A because that area is common to them both. Therefore, if there is a heaven and there is an earth, there has to be some middle which is similar to both. This feature then becomes an important feature for Plato. He says that we are within a sphere and the earth itself is a sphere. And the entire, the entire thing you see is in equipose. Everything is equally homogeneous throughout. It can't change. There's no shift of inclination because the earth is right in the middle of it all. And its axis runs right through the whole. Therefore, it's perfectly fit between, and this whole thing is the heavens. And what we're going to do, as you see, is we're going to have the image of the heavens, the earth, and there's going to be a higher view of the earth, a lower view of the heavens, and that's going to be the common. We can put it metaphysically, we can say that um, there's real being, real being, and becoming. We can talk about the fact that there is the good or the one. And we can say we are here. But there's a middle region which we can then participate in, which in fact is the realm of the intellect, being. It's that shared region. This is divine being. So the same thing. There we always have two with a third. The third is common. Now, let's see if we can then push this. What then do we encounter? Time again. Where was the time? Pardon? Time. Where was the time again? T I M E. Did you point out time? Between heaven and earth or something? Not to uh, well time time is a time is a moving image of eternity. Right? And therefore it's in a special region. See so, in the intellectual pure being, these things are eternal. If there is eternal, then there must be something that embraces it all, and that's eternity. Just like anything, any other class of things has a class of, has a, a, a number of things in the class, the class is always higher than the members. So, so to answer your question, which I hope I did. All right. What's encountered? He says, you know what's encountered? He says, first of all, he says, we don't understand our condition. That's the problem on this earth. We don't understand our condition. And as soon as we realize that, he says, everything will be much better. So let's get to the view of earth. What did we say with earth? There's going to be a higher aspect of earth that's common both to heaven and earth. So therefore, he says, what, where we live, we live in a... In a, in a Chasm, right? I, and it's full of brine, uh, salt waters, and fogs, and mists. And we don't know it. We take it to be a pure, of course, we understand it because we call it smog, right? <laughs> right? He says, here on our earth, there's nothing perfect. Our trees, flowers, fruits, and precious stones, they're only samples, they're not real. They're only fragments. He said, if we can ever raise ourselves up, as you can see in this beautiful picture, right, and stick our head up out of that brine, which corrodes everything, 
we would be astonished at what we could see. Now that's the upper earth or the lower heaven. He said, but you have to be strong enough to bear the light. He said, what you would discover is that there is, in fact, a true heaven, a true light, and a true earth. Now he makes a series of contrasts between these two in order to keep making the point right, that what we would say is that this world, the higher world, is the source of and the model for the world we live in, which is a copy. This is the archetype, this is the copy. We live in the archetype. Pardon me, we live in the copy. He said, there the colors are brighter, pure, purple, golden, white, and others. Everything there in this heaven is transparent, more lively. There we'll encounter temples in which they are gods, and we could then have intercourse with the gods, communication with the gods through speech, prophecies, visions. He said, life really is, and he has this analogy, as the water and the sea is, in that region, ether is to air. Hey, look here. What air is to us in our world, what we need to live and to breathe, brings us vitality. In their world, ether exists for them. Therefore, they're in an ethereal world where ether and air is primary, as water and the sea with all its corrosion and properties of decay are our world. There is true wisdom there. And he says, this is such a magnificently beautiful and pure state that he has this very wonderful statement about it. He says, look here, if anybody could catch a sight of this, if you could get, catch a sight of this, the very sight of it would make the person who looks upon it blessed. It's source of the divine man, right? One would be blessed by participating on this level of experience. Now, this is what he says. This is the real heaven. Right? This is where we live. We have to know about that difference. He says, now look here, what happens then? We're all led to judgment. And he has something very interesting. He has four rivers and several lakes. And I can talk about that in a few minutes, but, um, well, okay, okay. Let, let me do it for a moment quickly. Those people that have committed sacrilege against the gods, those people that have, per have performed wicked murders, they go to Tartarus, the river Tartarus, which is at the bottom of it all, and that's where they stay for an indefinite period of time. The same people who've committed those crimes under passion, they can stay there usually a year or so, and then the wave tosses them out to the river Cactus. Those who have, however, outraged their parents and have repented and have tried to make amends, try to understand it, they go to the river Priflegaton. Those that go to Coctus, those are the ones that committed their crimes under passion, right? they have to deal with this lake that the river pours into, the lake and river called Styx. There, there are fearful powers, it's terribly cold, and that begins to be the arena of punishment. Just as uh, Prilegathon, the punishment for those is through heat. After then, people have satisfied what, what it is that's going on in their souls. When they finally get to the Archcherian Lake, then they are cathartic, they've purified themselves, and they're ready for, they're ready to be reborn. Now, those who've lived a life 
where they lived neither well nor ill, no real great crimes, uh, good lives, but not philosophy, or they haven't really challenged their spirit in the quest for wisdom, they end up in that same river, Akshurayan, and there they get the rewards for the goods that they have done, and any negative they have to pay off, and then they quickly become into that pool for rebirth. Now, everybody, especially the people who have had vast crimes, they have to be in this terrible lake. And, and as these souls go by, anyone who has been cruel, murdered people, they have to cry and plead with those souls when they finally do come by and ask forgiveness from the very persons they have done in. If they have to wait again and again and again and again until the person says, okay, you're out. And then they can then go to the pool to be reborn. Notice the kind of crimes. It's a very interesting kind of crimes. It's so different than the Ten Commandments. It's very different. Right? The most heinous crimes, sacrilege against the gods, wicked murderers, right? those who've done many murders. Right? Then the other extreme, those who have done the same things under an act of passion, but have tried to uh, deal with it later in their lives, right? two groups. Then those people who neither did will nor, they, they lived okay, they did some things right, some things wrong. All right, no Ten Commandments. No eternal hell for breaking particular laws. But you have to pay for both right and wrong. And that's where the books are kept. So, look here. Um, I'd like to now get into a problem. We need a heresy. And that's up to me. Let's see if I can give you one. I now would like to see the dynamics that takes place in this next world, the dynamics, the forces that are at work, <clears throat> the way he describes it. And I'd like you to consider whether or not there may not be a relationship between what he is describing and things that we perhaps, very likely in any case, for this group, all can recognize. Pranayama, Hindu breathing exercises. All right, familiar? Everyone here is familiar with pranayama? Two kinds, Bastrika, right? And the Udyayi, right? Bastrika, the, the, the forceful breathing. And as we go through this and the way in which it's described, there's certain things he's going to connect with it. He's going to say, these forces are like breath, and the, where these powers go and what they do are like centers. He describes these forces by saying that they circle the earth and what do we have here? The familiar Kundalini. Kundalini. And here's the heresy. Is it possible that that's what's going on? Is it possible that he's described, he's using the word breath. He's going to talk about centers. He's going to talk about the serpent power. Now, is it possible that we can line them up? And then we have another heresy after that. But so this is the first. All right. Okay. Can, can, is it, yes. This whole thing, as you're describing, I mean, it sounds very similar to 
Too bad the book of the dead, right? From the beginning of getting you're, ready for the death and everything else. You're right? absolutely right. Yeah, absolutely. That's absolutely right. That's right. I was That's wondering, right. had he gone to Tibet? That's right. No, no, it's the other way around. Oh, oh, no, I, 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 because the matter. Tibetan Book of the Dead is the eighth century A.D. Right. Eighth to the ninth century A.D. I, Maybe tenth, depending upon I, who you read. Yeah. I, all right. I mean, all right. My mind, <laughs> all tonight, I've been thinking of you know, there's I, some connection over there. I have a friend of mine who's a very accomplished martial art. Um, well, let's see what we call them. Martial art, Kung Fu, no, not Kung Fu. What's the other? There are several. Um, taekwondo? Tai, no, not Taekwondo. I think tai, uh, Taekwondo as well. Karate, Taekwondo, several. And he made a study of Greek vases. All he did was study Greek vases where there are wrestling holes. And he did a beautiful paper, which I have a copy of, where he, can, he has shown that all of the formal holes are classic holes in karate and martial arts. If so, that means we have to look at the Greeks in a different way. Because we think that many of them started in Okinawa, we think they started by Buddhism much later. And with this colleague of mine, who I have fun joking with, I keep telling him if he's not going to publish it, I'm going to send copies around by, 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 by Xerox, through the good friend Xerox copying machines, so at least stuff can get out. Now, you know, some people can give birth to things, but they can't let them go. And he's one of those who's still clutching to his baby. <laughs> and it's a good one. It's a good one. So... Keep in touch, and I might get you a copy after I talk to him. Matter of fact, we will even give him a greater problem by telling him that we talked about him. All right. Here we go. I'll have to read this to you. Now, we were talking about this. All of these rivers flow together. They flow together and descend. They flow together and descend. Now, notice heat, cold. Right? There are very interesting things going on here. Well, okay, let's read it. <clears throat> For all the rivers flow together into this chasm and flow out of it again. And they have each the nature of the earth through which they flow. Right? So, each one, right, this, however this river flows, it picks up the nature of whatever it flows through. Principle of Kundalini Yoga. Each of the centers, each of the, the great chakra centers, has its own luminosity, has its own specific psychic state, and therefore as the Kundalini energy passes through each of the centers of the chakras, so one experiences different things appropriate to each of the chakras. And the reason why all the streams flow in and out is that this liquid matter has no bottom or foundation, right? No bottom. So what does it do? So it oscillates. Right. Hey. Right. These four rivers come down. All right. All right. And let's watch it. What does it do? It's a power. It goes up and down, up and down. It oscillates up and down from side to side. And the air and the wind about it do the same. Right? So the air and wind, right, does the same. That's right. So, right, so through that the air and wind do the same. Air going up and down, right? For they follow the liquid both when it moves towards the outer side and the earth and when it moves towards this side, see? One side to the earth, one side to the other, which is therefore the other side would be heaven. 
up and down oscillates. Just as the breath, see, he's doing it. Just as the breath of those who breathe blows in and out. So the wind there oscillates with the liquid and causes terrible and irresistible blasts as it rushes in and out. Bastrika, right, in Kundalini Yoga, right? The powerful breathing in and out, right? Where you generate great energy going in and out and breathing. And when the water retires to the region which we call the lower, it flows into the rivers there and fills them up as if it were pumped into them. And when it leaves that region, it comes back to the side, it fills the rivers there. Right? And when the streams are filled and they flow through the passages and through the earth and come to the various places to which their different paths leads, there they make the seas, the marshes, the rivers and the springs, the sources of life. I added that, by the way, sources of life. Hence they go down again under the earth, some passing around to many regions and others flowing into smaller places and so goes on into the description. It's a conclusion I want to get to though. But all flow in below their exit, right? There's a certain place, right? They flow in on the side from which they flowed out others on the opposite side, and some pass completely around in a circle, coiling about the earth once or several times like serpents, then descend to the lowest possible depth, a depth and fall again into the chasm. Now it's possible to go down from each side of the center. It's possible to go down each side, the Ida and the Pingala. It's possible to go down either side. But you can't go beyond them. Well, what does that look like? See the way he's talking about it? Now what's curious about this, you see, is you could say, well, if I do, whether it was intended that way or not, if every part fits, then that's an easy way to remember it. But there are so many things that are like this in Plato that separating the soul from the body is a yoga. That we may wonder whether or not this is possible. The language is there. The language is there. Well then what happens to someone who has mastered this? That is knowing death and dying and the process involved in it, isn't it? That's really what philosophy is about, true philosophy. Often d d ignored in the universities, but not here, thank goodness, right? And this is fun, this is, this is the challenge. Now, what happens to the philosopher? You see, we haven't talked once about the philosopher throughout this whole thing. Oh yes, when we started, we mentioned it just once. And therefore, I'd like to give you another puzzle and possibly dealing with the same puzzle we had last time in the myth of Ur. Return to it once again. Let me make it clear. We put it up here. What follows? What are the implications? of these two positions. The soul of each and every one is reborn again and again and again. Sometimes a better birth, sometimes a worse one. Unending. What are the implications of the Buddhist view? Which is, uh, it is possible to get off the wheel of birth and death. Off. 
nirvana, blowing out the, the very thirst. These are certainly different, aren't they? One and two, they're different. Now, this later view took many years to develop. And the question we had last time was whether or not we can read the myth of Ur in such a way that it is quite possible for the philosopher to be included here. If so, then we have to change the whole view of Platonic philosophy. So, that's our riddle. And that's the problem of the philosopher in Plato. In order to see if I can get you into it, please. I'd like to share with you and again, what's most interesting about Plato, if he does this once, he does it again and again and again. He will often compact what he's doing in one or two sentences. And you have to pull it apart. You have to open it up and see what's in it. He'll spend paragraphs on some points. And you might look at those points and say, I wish he had spent that much time on how to separate the soul from the body and tell me how you do that habit trick and when can you do it and what it's like and what you what you should do if that's possible, and all those kinds of nice questions. But no, he only gave us that one sentence. Well, I'll give you another sentence. Here it is. And of all these, all who have duly purified themselves I should say. And all of these who have duly purified themselves by philosophy. Now remember what he means by philosophy is what we described a moment ago, which is separation of the soul from the body. Live here, and it's a very interesting word, here forth, all together, without bodies and pass to still more beautiful abodes which it's not easy to describe, nor do we have time now. See, he cheated us again. Mm -hmm. Right, just where we would like him to go on for a couple of more paragraphs, what does he say? Ah, there it is, look at that terrible line. See, which it's not easy to describe those beautiful abodes, nor have we now time enough. Oh, Socrates. Mm -hmm. Now look here. If duly purified, what does that mean? If they've duly purified themselves by philosophy, what will happen to them? They will live here forth, all together without bodies, and pass on to still more beautiful abodes. Now, this is all you have. This is, this is all he gives us. Now, can you make a case for getting off the wheel of uh, existence, life and death, with that quote? Well, what, you know what you can do? At least you can say, we know one thing. All right, there isn't anybody here who won't agree to this. How about that? This is good. That is it not absolutely clear to you that if you're reborn, you're going to have a body? Right? 
<laughs> so, but look here. So, look what he's saying here. You'll live hereforth, right? Without, all together, without a body. So you're going to live without a body from this point on and pass still to more beautiful abodes than those that he just described. Well, um, by chance, did anyone bring a copy of Plato? Another copy of a different translation? I have a couple of translations. Could I have one, please? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Watch what happens now. We'll read, look at another. Oh, could you? Yes, that's Jowett. Is it gl or Gloob? Yeah, Gloob. Yeah, could you? Those who have purified themselves sufficiently by philosophy live in the future altogether without a body. They make their way to even more beautiful dwelling places which, hard, which is hard to describe clearly. Nor do we have the time to do so. So that's very close, isn't it? Right? They live in the future altogether without a body. That's, that's a, could you give yours, please? Okay. Uh, and they reach the pure dwelling place up above and live on the surface of the earth. And of these, those who have sufficiently purified themselves by means of philosophy dwell free from the body for all time to come and arrive at habitations even fairer than these, habitations that it is not easy to describe and there is no time to make the attempt now. Now, this volume is better than all of yours, since obviously I paid more money for it. Let me try this one. Now, look at this difference. Among these, those who are sufficiently purified by philosophy shall live without bodies through the whole of the succeeding time. So he's saying so for the succeeding time. So he has a bracket around that, doesn't he? Would it not be more difficult to make the case with this? Right. Question a little the better here, and certainly with the Groove translation, even more so. And with yours? All time to come. All time to come. Strongest. Yeah. Same same Greek, right? One person puts a time limit on it, another person says, For all time to come. And that's why there's a problem translating Plato. You can't have all four meanings. And agree. But in any case, right, you have the problem. See what's at stake? The stake that all of these people are wrestling with is what shall we say about the nature of philosophy if we can say this? Go ahead. Heretical. <coughs> Pardon? That's heretical. Yes, I thought you would enjoy both understanding, <laughs> puzzles, and heresy. <laughs> All right? Got it all there. Got it all there? Yeah. Then so far it's been successful? Yeah. All right, so now we go back. All right. See, so we're suggesting by this that there is a spiritual dimension to Plato that's central to understand what he is doing. We built our case on the idea of death saying that it's clearly different from what most people regard it as, that it involves the study of dying process and the state of being dead. Right? We've then took a look at 
What it's like when it does that? What does it encounter? Wisdom. The ending of the story is he reaches wisdom. Most beautiful. Right? We then, would you agree, we went back into the text and we found this very description of the separation of the soul from the body as a habit, something you have to collect, something you have to do. We called that a yoga, did we not? A spiritual practice. And this is what it leads you into. And it leads you into an experience where there are these qualities of the changeless, unchanging, always remaining the same. Did we find, therefore, that this is the very way in which he describes the real earth, the higher earth, homogeneous, cannot move, change, changeless, no shift possible, centered. Right. Did we not say that it's essential in this game that you have to understand the circumstances of what you're doing for either kind of death, physical death or, sp or spiritual trip? Right. We then saw the way in which he describes the two worlds. And would you not agree, through this whole description, he culminates in it with, hey, you know what this is? Experience of wisdom. What's it like then? It's a state in which all of these things can be said. And it is so significant that anyone who uh, chances upon to see it or looks upon it, the sight of it will make the person blessed and therefore it's a spiritual culminating point. Okay. It, uh, allows an intercourse with the gods, right, through speech, prophecy, visions. <clears throat> we then looked at the major centers throughout this in the afterworld, seeing what happens to the kinds of people who are reborn. Okay. We then took a look at the processes of what goes on to take a look at it as a dynamic, and we related to Kundalini Yoga, didn't we? And the whole Bastrika and Udyani kinds of practices the, uh, in Pranayama. That's what we've done, and therefore we can say it looks like we've tried to reach understanding, puzzles, and heresy. Questions? Um, this section reminds me very much of alchemy. So in here you could, mm -hmm. you know, you've got um, purification, mm -hmm. philosopher's stone down there, mm -hmm. and going to the beautiful abode is making gold or the yes. better metal yeah. from the base metal. Yeah. So oh, the alchemy. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yes, that's right. Yeah, I think that's what they're doing. Yeah, yeah, quite right. And if you and I can agree upon it, we can feel secure that we may be able to persuade others. Can I help you with any part of it? Go back over any part in more detail. Glad to. You mentioned two heresies. <laughs> What's the second? Well, it's what we landed with. This is the heresy. This is the heresy. Oh, this is the second. This is the heresy. For this would put Plato directly in a spiritual tradition. And would you not agree there are many places that teach Plato as an intellectual system that doesn't have anything to do with the spiritual development of mankind? And this would anchor it right square in the middle of it, wouldn't it? Okay. So that if someone were to do comparative research, it would be better to study Alkindi and uh, Pranayama and uh, Kundalini Yoga for possible parallels than it would be looking up certain texts or criticisms of, Pl of Plato by certain authors who write many articles and journals. Different kind of research, right? Comparative research crossing the line, where people are still keeping up with this tradition, and you'd want to see how it manifests itself. Because once this is killed, which it was in Europe, then you have to find where, where it's still going on to go back to see whether you can find the parallels. We're suggesting here, parallels look like we can find it in comparative studies of yoga, kundalini yoga, alchemy, etc. Alkindu. Thank you. Thank you.